Good morning, everybody. Let's stand up and worship the Lord together.
Amen. Welcome to Stewart Heights. We're so glad to have you this morning. How are y'all doing today? Good. Let's continue to worship. <laughs> 
Father, we thank you for this time. Once again, to come into your house to sing of your praises, to sing of your goodness, to sing of your love. Father, and as we celebrated Easter last week and the resurrection of your Son, Father, we still celebrate that today. Father, help us to not think of the cross and the resurrection once a year, one weekend a year, but help us to continually have that in our minds of your love for us. Anytime we doubt your love, your goodness, all we have to do is look to the cross, look to Calvary, look to the empty tomb to see your love for us. And fathers, we just saying we thank you that you came after us. So many people in this world are confused by that fact because every other religion, they are trying to earn favor with God. They are trying to bridge that gap on their own. But Father, we thank you that because we could not do those things, that you reached down to us. You sent your son here. You came after us. And Father, we thank you for that. We give you the glory this morning. Father, we pray that you'll be with this time, that you will use this time to encourage us to call us into the mission field, Father. Father, we thank you for all that you do. We love you and praise you. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Let's take a few moments, shake hands with those around you. Welcome them here this morning. Will you pray with me? And as we pray, I I want to invite you for just a moment to spend a, a, a couple of seconds here talking to God about what you expected when you got here this morning. Because if you are like me, you've been around church a long time. And we are, by nature, often creatures of habit to where we either intentionally or unintentionally fall into expectation of the same thing. Father God, I confess to you this morning that very often I come to a full Sunday with many things to do. (laughs) 
with a lack of expectation that you will interrupt our day. And as we have brought worship to you this morning, Father, right now, through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, I invite you, Lord, to come and interrupt me. Interrupt us. If we came this morning with the expectation of business as usual, Lord, interrupt us. As we open your word, God, interrupt us. As we celebrate communion this morning, God, interrupt us. As we prepare to go at the end of our time this morning, to go on mission as we move through the rest of the day, Father, interrupt us. We are so prone to self-exaltation of our plan and our desire. Father, interrupt us. Lord, as we open your word, will you quicken us by the moving of your spirit to not merely mentally or intellectually understand it, but to be moved and compelled and drawn to you that anything other than whole and complete obedience Would, would be cast aside and that we would lay ourselves out before you to be used by you for your glory. So come now, Father, and, and move in us through your spirit to, to glorify yourself through this time in your word as you make us more and more into the image of Christ. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Last week at Easter at Coolidge, we had a grand opportunity to gather with thousands of friends. And, and that's not an overstatement. That's not ministerially speaking. It was a beautiful day and, and, and literally thousands of people uh, were there in uh, Coolidge Park to worship and to celebrate, and we realize and we fully understand there were some people there in the park on Sunday that were just in the park on Sunday, uh, not by chance, but rather by God's divine design that, that they would be there to, to see God's people and to hear the good proclamation of the good news of Christ. But it was a, a busy season of life in our church leading up to that day, and we spend uh, weeks and months in preparation for about five hours together. But we had a wonderful opportunity not merely to celebrate the risen Savior, but also proclaim Him to people that did not know Him and to, to give this act of uh, 
service and kindness to our neighbors. And so we thank you. If you volunteered for that, thank you for your investment in the spread of the gospel in Chattanooga. But then we've had a, a busy week in, in follow-up and in also in preparation for, for Friday night uh, as we gathered with some folks and we had some gathering in home groups for this thing called Secret Church. How many of you have heard of Secret Church? It's like the worst-kept secret in America. It's, uh, a secret Church is a thing that, that David Platt started several years ago. This was Secret Church 19. And, and we gathered uh, Friday evening at our Hickson campus, and then, like I said, several people met in homes, and we actually have access to that through the end of May. And so if your uh, Sunday school class or your small group wants to, to have access to that so we can uh, watch that or you can in, enjoy that, uh, just know that you don't have to do it all at once. Uh, it's about six hours long. And so we went Friday night at 7 till Saturday morning about 1 or 1.30 and and looked at the entirety of the scripture on prayer and fasting in the pursuit of God. And enjoyed that time together, just being immersed in God's word and being drawn and compelled through the moving of the spirit and the truth of the scripture that we ought to be people, not mere, because we hear this terminology, we ought to be people of prayer. We, we take that terminology very loosely and... and um, I would encourage you, if at all possible, um, invest those six plus hours in your walk with Christ. It's very encouraging and convicting at the same time. And so we're, we're coming off this celebration of Easter and we're spending this time Friday night focusing on prayer the exercise of who we are as God's people. Coming to this morning, and, and I was reminded Friday night, through the secret church experience, there's always a, a prayer focus for a people group. And Friday night, we spent time praying for the Somalis of East Africa. There are brothers and sisters of faith in that people group who endure horrific pers persecution for the sake of the gospel. And we prayed for their perseverance. We prayed that God would raise up pastors among them to, to shepherd and to lead and to serve, and that God would raise up missionaries to, to go and to take the gospel into that very hardened and dark and difficult and dangerous place so that the name of Christ would be proclaimed and that God would be worshipped. And I thought about the stark contrast between what we experienced last Sunday of thousands of us coming and enjoying the freedom to gather to worship. And the stark difference that is from many of our brothers and sisters around the world who would love to have the opportunity to gather with that many people for the sake of worship, but they gather with just a few believers and they rarely sing because they don't want to draw attention to themselves for fear of persecution. And I thought about what we do on every Sunday gathering. And what do I expect when we come? Do I expect God to, to move in a way that compels us to worship and to desire Him and to love Him and to serve Him and to risk our lives to go and proclaim Him? Or do I do what I've done all of my life on Sunday, which is go to church? We are invited this morning to do something for the church. So we're going to share in communion together this morning. But before we do that, I want to look at what Paul instructs the church at Corinth. Because they had taken these, 
gatherings and turned them into something very selfishly motivated and, and carnal at worst. So to set our minds and to set our hearts and our spirit in a right place before we share communion together, I want us to look at just four brief things from this text that will hopefully shape our expectations into something grander than just religious ritual. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes this to the church at Corinth. He said, For I received from the Lord, beginning of verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you may not come together for judgment. And the remaining matters I shall arrange when I come. And we're not going to do an exhaustive examination of this text this morning, but I do want us to look at a few things, a few principles that will hopefully... Again, shape how we come to the Lord's table. And the context here is Paul is writing to the church at Corinth about some very carnal practices that they had allowed to come into their gathering. Where they were approaching these times together in a self-motivated and selfish manner. And Paul corrects them in how they come not merely to the Lord's table, but that they had turned the celebration of communion into something fleshly. And he brings strong words of correction and exhortation here. But the first thing that we see in this text is the mandate by Christ that as he shared the Passover with his disciples, he said, every time you do this, remember me. Or do this in remembrance of me, depending on the translation of the scripture that you have. And I thought about this doing in remembering, in church tradition, in the way that we do things. Because we we share in communion, and people call it different things in different churches, in different faith traditions. You've got uh, the Lord's Supper. That's what we grew up with. We called it the Lord's Supper. We've got communion. I remember the first time I heard the word Eucharist. I didn't know what that was. But based on your church background and your denominational affiliation, it may be a different thing. It may be uh, exercised a different way. I remember the the table that was in front of the pulpit in the church that I grew up in where I assumed every church had one of those because every church I'd ever been in had one of those in front of the pulpit. It had the same engraving on the front in remembrance of me. I'm seeing some head shaking of of my my tribe that, that you know what that's like. And on on communion Sundays, there would be a a, a new white tablecloth that was on there and and the very shiny trays and all those kind of things. And so that's what I understood. And I remember the first time that I celebrated communion in a different way. I thought, I'm not sure we can do this. Actually, I thought we could. I just didn't know how. I I just wanted to follow the person in front of me, so I didn't look silly. 
But that word to do this in remembering him. I always found very interesting. Because Jesus is telling the disciples when you do this, because there's an an implication and an, an understanding there, you'll do this again. When you do this, remember me. Or do these things in remembrance of me. And I thought, I struggle with my memory. I've probably had to ask some of you your name multiple times. I appreciate you telling me the same name every time I ask you. I thought, surely Jesus isn't thinking they're going to forget him. This word remembering is a is a a unique word. It's talking about about a memorial remembering. The way that Jesus gives this, the the, the structure of the word, is is that it is a a repetitious thing. To do it in remembering him is to call to mind in a memorial type of way. And in remembrance of me means that the participant may remember Christ and the sacrifice of his death and what that accomplishes for us as followers of Jesus. And so we can rightly take that instruction, that mandate for those first followers of Jesus to do this in remembering him and we can put ourselves in the recipients of that command, that mandate, that when we come that we remember him. And, and I know that that's not new. If you've been a follower of Jesus for any amount of time, you've heard this reminding. But when we talk about being reminded and remembering, what is it that we ought to be pondering right now? Like in this moment right now, when I've said we're going to share communion together and that we are called to do this in remembrance of him, right now, what are the things that are that are flooding your mind of remembering? What are the things right now in this moment that are competing for your attention and for your affection? When Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, we're not just coming and saying, okay, I remember that Jesus died on the cross. What about that? If that doesn't move us, if that doesn't compel us in some way, then I'm convinced we're not giving it the full attention that we should. So I want to invite you as we do this, remembering him, that these are some of the things that we are called to remember. That we remember the truth of Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There was a time when you did not know Jesus. There was a time when you were separated from him, when you were far away from him. Because you, like every other person that had breathed, like I, like every other person who has ever had life, have sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And that puts us in a desperately hopeless situation except for the reality that Jesus came to die for us. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but the reality of that is that the wages of sin is death. What we rightly deserve as sinful people, is eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And God, in his mercy, in his love, in his grace, he demonstrated his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Brothers and sisters, I am convinced that we do not merely ponder the reality of the gospel nearly enough. I am convinced that I do not just sit and ponder the simple truth of the good news of the gospel that just because I was a preacher's kid and, and, and I was supposedly the good kid. Not implying that my sister was the bad kid. I'm just, I was a good little rule keeper. 
I was desperately wicked and separated from God by my sin. And God demonstrated his love for me in that while I was still a sinner, before I was even around, Jesus died for me. And we celebrate the resurrection, and rightfully so, because we don't have a dead Jesus. We have a risen Savior. But when we come to the table and we do this remembering Him, this is what we ought to be remembering, the truth of the gospel, that we are the glad recipients of God's grace gloriously bestowed on us through the sacrifice of Jesus. So communion is for remembering. It's not merely for remembering, it's also for reflection. It's while Paul gives this insight into the words of Christ at the supper. He then calls those who are receiving this letter And we are receiving this letter through God's preserving of his word so that we can take these instructions and apply them as well. He says, Jesus gives these instructions, and therefore, verse 27, therefore, whoever eats of the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the blood and, or the body and the blood of the Lord. And so he says, don't do that, but rather... Let a man examine himself so that he may eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So what ought we be examining right now? As we are, as we, as we are remembering the good news of the gospel and that we are redeemed and that we are reconciled unto God and that we have been made alive together through Christ. What then are the things that we ought to be examining and not merely us looking because we will always give ourselves a better grade than we should. Because we we want to grade on the curve of not examining ourselves as in comparison to Christ, but maybe we examine ourselves in comparison to that guy. I'm not as bad as that guy. Well, yeah, you really are. But rather than us merely examining our, ourselves, we need to be examined by the moving of the Spirit. As we share in communion together, and as we think about and ponder the glorious, beautiful gospel of Jesus, we ought also be asking God, Lord, through the power of your Spirit, examine my heart, examine my life. And if there's anything in me that does not reflect Jesus or honor Christ, we, we love things that are easy to remember. And so as we examine, there are three things here that we could think about examining. First of all, our walk. Just asking Jesus, am I walking well with you? Am I walking in intimacy with you? Am I enjoying the gift of a relationship with you? We talk about that in in terms of things like spiritual disciplines. Are you in the Bible every day? Are you praying every day? And and, and as we do that, we immediately start making a checkbox. So, okay, here are the things I've got to do today. Here are the things I've got to do today. Relationships aren't made that way. Those are good and wonderful practices to engage. I encourage you to be actively engaged in spiritual disciplines in your walk with, the, with Christ. I encourage you to daily be in the Word. I encourage you to daily be in prayer. I encourage you to regularly gather with God's people. But you're already here, so you're doing at least that part. But the moment that becomes a checklist of things to do, Already we have moved our eyes off of the prize of Jesus and put it on a, on a list. But when we approach 
prayer with this truth that God, who spoke the world into being, who spoke everything into being, the creator of the universe, the maker of us, invites us to a relationship with him. When we pray, the creator of the universe listens to us. That ought to blow our minds. That ought to change the way that we engage God in prayer. When we take up this word, this book, that God inspired and that God has preserved for us and that God was kind enough and gracious to us to put it into a language that we can read and we can understand. When we think about the nature of the Bible and the nature of prayer, there's no way we can compress that rightly into a checklist. So when we talk about our asking God to examine our walk with him. Has it merely become religious ritual or are we fully enjoying the intimacy of a relationship with the creator of the universe who sent his son to redeem us, to rightly relate us to himself? So we ask God to examine our, our walk Ask God to examine our words. Do our words reflect Jesus in the way that we speak to one another? Ask God to examine our walk and our words and finally our witness. Asking God to, to show us where our proclamation of knowing Jesus and our witness to the world may not match. So as we come to the table, we come remembering and, and, and glorifying God in and through the gospel, asking God to examine us through reflection. And then how do we respond in that? Paul talks about that in verse 29 and 30. That this is a time of remembering and a time of reflecting, and it may be a time of repentance. If in that reflecting and asking God to examine us, God quickens us and convicts us of things in our life that are not as they should be in our walk with him, then right now, not, not later, right now, as you're thinking about these things, now is the time to come and repent of those before God. And repent means to change direction and go a different way, not just to turn away from something, but to turn away from one thing and to something else. So instead of continually choosing this thing, I'm going to choose this. Paul talks about that. He says, for he who, eat, uh, verse 29, for he who drinks, uh, eats and drinks, he eats and drinks judgment to himself. This is where if you've ever heard Daryl preach on this, he loves to, to, to get on the word damnation right there. He drinks judgment to himself, for he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. Do you hear what Paul's saying right there? You are being so disobedient that your disobedience is now having physical effect on you. There are those numbered among the church at Corinth who are physically feeling the consequences of their sin. For this reason, referring to what he just said, it's a purpose clause. Because some of you are doing this, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. This is serious business. This is not religious ritual. We are gathering this morning to celebrate the gospel. To worship our creator and our redeemer and our reconciler.
and to do so in a right manner to where if there are things where we knowingly are being sinful, that we repent of those things and we don't do those things anymore. For this reason, many among them are weak and sick and in number sleep, but if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned among the world or along with the world. So this as we examine and more appropriately ask God to examine our hearts and lives, we, we, we gratefully, <coughs> excuse me, and gladly repent before the Lord, knowing that as we repent, that we are forgiven. And the intimacy of relationship is restored. Which is what we see here in verse 32. That communion is for rejoicing. And you might be reading and think, Brian, well, in verse 32, he's talking about being disciplined by the Lord. Now you're talking about rejoicing. Aren't those different? No. We rejoice in the discipline of the Lord. That seems counterintuitive because discipline is not pleasant, but it is purposeful and beneficial. Several places the writer of Proverbs talks to us about the benefit of discipline in Proverbs 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. He writes, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof, for whom the Lord loves, he reproves. Even as the Father corrects the Son in whom he delights. Right now, if you are taking what we've talked about and putting it in application, and you're, re, you're remembering the gospel, and, and you are reflecting on your life and asking God to examine you, and God is bringing things to you that are, are not pleasing to him, and you're repenting of those, and you're right now enjoying the discipline of the Lord, be affirmed, brother and sister, that he who the Lord loves, he disciplines. I've heard it put this way, that discipline is proof of sonship or daughterhood. That if you're receiving the discipline of the Lord, it is because he loves you. And he desires good for you. There's the difference between the word punishment and discipline. I'm talking about discipline. This is reproving for our benefit and ultimately for God's glory. The writer of Proverbs continues in chapter 12, verse 1. He says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. And then he, he gets a little, he, he writes clearly, but he who hates reproof is stupid. Proverbs 13, 1, a wise son accepts his, father, accepts his father's discipline, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. In Hebrews 12, 7, it is for discipline that you endure, for God deals with you as sons. For what son is there among whom his father does not discipline? So rejoice, brother and sister. Rejoice in the good news of the gospel. Rejoice in the reality that we have a heavenly Father who loves us and desires good for us and is willing to discipline us when we make it necessary by our disobedience because he loves us. So rejoice in the gospel. Rejoice in the fact that we belong to him. Rejoice in the reality that we have been redeemed by Christ and reconciled to God through the sacrifice of Jesus. Rejoice in the fact that we have the privilege this morning of coming to the table to remember him and to respond to his work in our lives. Not through religious ritual. Not through the same old expectation. But that today we would do this remembering him, rejoicing in him, if necessary, receiving his discipline.
but celebrating the fact that we are redeemed and that we are reconciled unto God. So I want to invite you to pray, to bow your heads and to close your eyes as our deacons are going to get in their place to serve the elements of communion to us. We thank them for that. But as they move into place, I want to invite you right now to pray. Pray prayers of thanksgiving unto God for the good news of the gospel. To pray prayers of repentance if necessary. And if you are here this morning and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, maybe the prayer this morning that you would pray, that you would ask God, would be to forgive you of your sins and to reconcile you unto Himself to where you would repent of sin and turn away from your sins, ask Jesus to forgive you and to proclaim Jesus as the Lord of your life, that may be the place where you would need to begin. If you've got questions about how to do that, we would love to speak with you at the end of our service today.